Well, winter is certainly upon us here in the Southern Hemisphere, and there is snow on the Alps. If that appeals to you, then I would thoroughly encourage you to head across to the siteshed.com forward slash events and check out the program we're running called Learn and Ski. In August this year, we'll be taking a group of business owners over to the lovely Wanaka in New Zealand, where we will be partaking in a ski workshop. We will be skiing in the mornings and then we will be workshopping in the afternoons and then the evenings we will no doubt be checking out the bars and restaurants of Wanaka in New Zealand. It's a beautiful spot and there's some great mountains there. So if that's something that appeals to you, come along. It's basically a tax deductible trip and I've put that together because uh, I wanna help you guys find a way that you can take a bit of time out, get along, invest in yourselves, invest in your business and learn some cool stuff that you can implement into your uh, into your company while you also get a few runs in on the hill. So it's going to be a load of fun. There's a bunch of really cool people coming along. If it sounds like something you want to do, head across to the siteshed.com forward slash events. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to Toolbox Talks. My name is Matt Jones. Now, tell me something. Have you guys ever worked in a family business or are you currently working in a family business? And not necessarily being one of the family members, however, being are working in a organization that is made up of a lot of relatives. They always have their challenges and they have challenges both internally and externally. Um, and in this episode, I'm joined by um, Al Levy from Appleseed Business. And Al has uh, been on the show a number of times. However, in this instance, I thought it'd be really cool to cover off on a, um, on a series that is talking about family and family organizations. And this series name is Why Most Family Businesses Don't Work and How the Seven Power Contractor Approach Can Help. It's We've broken it down into three different episodes. Episode one, we're talking about planning power and building a flat organizational chart into your company. And then we're talking in this following episode about operating power, how you can define in writing what goes on you know, within those um, organizational chart categories. And then the final episode, we're talking about leadership and we're talking about why you know leadership is so important in steering that ship to where it needs to go so this is a cracking series once again al levy has gone above and beyond in delivering amazing content he really is an incredible communicator and he's also um, offered uh, a call to action which will be on the um, show notes where you can get a uh, receive a sample of his book and of course that will have then a link to the actual book if you want to continue reading but i thoroughly encourage you all to check that out anyway uh, that's all from me let's dive right in giving tradies and contractors around the globe the tools to run a modern business you're listening to toolbox talks from the site shed now here's your host matt jones Hello and welcome back to episode three of the three-part series um, I'm conducting with friend and co-host Al Levy from Appleseed Business. The series name is Why Most Family Businesses Don't Work and How the Seven Power Contractor Approach Can Help. Uh, Al, thank you once again for joining us back at the microphone. How are you? I'm doing great. Excited to share what's next. Absolutely. So I've recapped in, uh, I recapped the last episode in the last podcast how about you give us a bit of a recap on what we spoke about in episode one and two just for the listeners so we got started with you know why are, why do businesses family businesses work or don't work and what seven power contracts can do so we started off in episode one about uh, planning power and the need to build a flat organizational chart and what that means and in episode two we talked about once you know what the operating org chart looks like and the boxes now we've got objective written policies and procedures that empower family members in particular to be successful in the boxes they occupy and let them go and grow and work themselves up. And if we do this really well, we can leverage ourselves out and grow into new and exciting. So as more and more family members come on, that's not a bad thing. That's a wonderful thing. As long as they're coming in the right way, they're being held accountable, uh, they're being productive, uh, they'll feel good. You'll feel good. And we're now we're starting to get to the juicy, juicy stuff, which what I like to say is, Matt, I wouldn't let you eat dessert till you proved you could eat your vegetables. Well, we're coming to dessert time, which is leadership. <laughs> <laughs> I, we actually, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if you caught it, but we actually just recorded only, oh, what was it? Maybe it was back in episode uh, 36 through to 39. We did a, we did a, um, a series on leadership with a uh, leadership consultant called Peter Cox. And it was a fantastic um, series. It actually got a lot of good feedback. So this is, I'm looking forward to this because it will almost, I'm guessing, kind of tie into that. 
So, right, let's, who are we talking to here, Al? Are we directing this? Is this directed at business owners? Is this directed at, you know, staff, apprentices? Who, who, who are we pointing this one at? Yeah, you know, in this particular one, um, going back to, again, uh, the listeners that are joining here or they've already been on it, we're talking about, you know, family businesses, but mm-hmm. I'm talking to every one of your listeners because whether you're related or not, every business that I've ever been in acts like a family. Uh, and that's what we've talked before about is whoever sits as an owner, whether you're related or not, you're perceived to be the dad. And then the only question is, what kind of dad are you? Yeah. Are you a supportive, loving, no, help me grow dad or, a, you know, a miserable tyrant kind of dad? And that's really all that gets to be decided here. I, I also, Al, I also imagine, just to interrupt you, but I also imagine there'd be a lot of people out there that are not necessarily part um, of the family, however, work in a family business, and they could be listening to this, this podcast series and be taking principles that they may be able to take back to the family and say, listen, why don't we start implementing some of this stuff that I was listened to because it could potentially help the growth of the business. Yes, and, it, and it, that's a great, great point. Be aware, though, it's not so much what you say, it's how you say it. So if I were to role play this with Matt. <laughs> Always. If I was to role play with Matt, yeah, well, what Matt just brought up is really important this is because it's, 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 it's really important that you see that me, Al, or Matt coming into the business is a good thing because it's continuity and the rest of it. But it's really up to dad, the ownership to, to see, not through filtered lenses, colored lenses, but what really is and isn't going. And it's really helping everybody. But uh, the way that I would say is, you know, I've just heard a really great seminar and we talked yeah. about how family businesses operate. Mm-hmm. And I know I'm not a relative here and we're bringing people on, but what this guy was saying and, and Matt was talking about was that there's a way that we can empower people to come on in the family and be a, a productive and, and really feel accomplished. And we can grow this even better. And it's a path for all of us, whether we're relatives or not in the family. And this could be great for all of us. And that is a great way to lead. Yeah. That would be my approach if I'm a manager at a company, let's say, or yeah. even a worker at a company and I want to share about there's a better way to do this. Oh, yes, you'd have to tread very carefully in a lot of those scenarios, I'm sure. <laughs> no, yeah, you know, but, but so, but the owner doesn't benefit. You're frustrated. What are you going to do if you have the option? You're going to bail out. Well, that right. hurts everybody. Exactly. That's not, so being silent is not really good. All that I'm saying, but that's like all conversations. And I, and I would I would probably add add to that as well. You know, if, you, if you're working for somebody that, doesn't want to doesn't doesn't want to hear the truth head on, then they're probably not a leader themselves. So maybe it's not the right place to be working. It, I, you know, Matt, that's a good point. Is uh, and that is, uh, you don't have to live and die. We hopefully are not dealing with slaves. So the feeling is that you're free. It may not feel that way, but there's a freedom. And the more talented you are, and the more you skill and work and train and learn and grow, you at whatever level you are, owner, manager, worker, whatever you are. Freedom is a wonderful thing because then you get to choose where you work and who you work and where you go. And that, that's just such a wonderful way to wake up and enjoy your day, Yeah, which, which is a good transition to leadership. Yeah, well, this is right. And when we were talking about leadership, I think one of the common traits, and it's actually something that I've very, very recently seen with a, a, a client and, and a, good, a good friend of mine has been for a lot of years, um, has a huge, huge business. And he's in a position now where like, there's so many people that just expect him to produce the right answer all the time. And he was in a scenario where that, in this instance, it certainly wasn't the case, but there was no one really telling him that that, that was the case. So, you know, when, I, when he was telling me what was going on and I was able to say to him, mate, you're doing this completely backwards, <laughs> it was a revelation for him because he's so used to people telling him what he wants to hear as opposed to what he needs to hear. But as a result, you know, we've, you know, the business yeah. has sort of taken a slightly different direction, but it's been amazing for them already, you know. So that to me is leadership, like being able to take that advice. Yeah, and that goes to the, the old story about the emperor has no clothes, which is, you know, everybody, nobody wanted to tell the emperor that he was naked. So, uh <laughs> Because that's but but how do you make any progress if you're working for the right people and you've set up the right culture? And in my case, anybody could talk to me about anything, and it really wasn't this make believe open policy or policy that everybody advocates but never really follows up. Um, I needed to find out, and a matter of fact, going back to operating power, we had mentioned in uh, one of the series that the manuals are not created in like you know 
your, your partner here would go inside, create the manual there, everybody comes out and go, oh, well, it's great. Thank you. <laughs> but they never really put it in play. If, if they feel it's got some, no, the guys go, well, how do you, excuse me, uh, Mr. Boss owner, I do this every day. So don't you think you ought to ask me how I should fix the, uh, the toilet? Yeah. Uh, you know, and so that's, so I'm glad that he, then you helped dry his blinders off because he was doing himself damage. And he was not only doing himself damage, he was doing damage to his organization and people who were there. And uh, that is, and that is really at the key of leadership, which is, that said, you know, there is this point in leadership, which I want to kind of dig into. Uh, the usual workshop thing is, uh, what's the difference between a leader and a manager? A leader, uh, excuse me, a manager is arranging the deck chairs on the Titanic as it's headed to the iceberg. A leader is hopefully steering the ship away from the iceberg. Yeah. There's a time to do both activities. You know, there is a lot of management, but ultimately it won't make a difference how you arrange the deck chairs if you don't get away from the iceberg. Right. So someone at the company is charged with leading and steering us to where we want to go. Uh, and that is, but not like you, Matt, drive the car. I'm mean, sit in the back seat and don't talk till I tell you to talk. That's not what we want. Not for our company and absolutely not for the family members. I shared with one of the other episodes, which is I worked with my two older brothers and my dad. And the odd thing about it is that, you know, I had a large leadership role there. Uh, I saw that things were, could be better and I wanted things to be better. And I had to get them to buy into what it is. So even though I was leading, I was, uh, I was driving the car, but it wasn't like they weren't agreeing to be in the car in the direction that yeah. I'm heading to. So my point here is when there is more than one owner in particular, there's only one set of hands on the steering wheel when you drive. Now, somebody can be giving you directions. Somebody can be passing the food. And we all agree we want to be in this car because wherever we're driving to, we're a, we're a million-dollar company today. We want to be $5 million in uh, two years from now, and $20 million in 30 years, whatever that is. And we want to bring more family members on, and we want them to be successful. All of what we want is in now is the first time we're really getting down to brass tacks which is setting a common goal and getting all of the family members on the same page. In essence, that is really what leadership power is in this particular case and really what I strive to get down to. I think as well, Al, um, one thing that we <clears throat> capped off or we, we touched on uh, all the way back in episode 38 in, in, in the series you did in leadership was that you're not necessarily i mean you can be the business owner and you can be you know extremely good at your given trade or profession or whatever it is however don't be under the illusion that just because you know you founded the company you're the best person to be leading that organization and i have a client who's um uh, located down in in melbourne and he for years and years just the, the business wasn't growing properly and he came to the realization that it wasn't growing because despite the fact that the company, it was a good company and it was making money, he it wasn't being led correctly and he knew he wasn't the right person to be leading it. So he brought on a CEO into the company and since he did that, the company compounded. And I think that's a good scenario in, in a lot of cases. I will tell you though, uh, for my 15 year of consulting, if you without the owner. So there's times that I've worked at with the managers at big companies and, and they got all excited. And then the owner walked into the room after we were all done and go, nah, we're not going to do that well, That's because <laughs> he didn't participate. Right. And he didn't, you, you follow what I mean? So at the end of this, I said no more. And uh, the one that comes to mind is the big company that I worked with up in uh, Montreal is that I, I told him when he, he had the just monstrous organizational chart, pages and pages, and I saw all these vice presidents and I said, if you think I'm going to work with them and we're going to change anything, don't waste my time and don't waste your money. I said, uh, I'm going to be working with you. And uh, when he did that is when really things took off mm. in a good way. You know what I mean? But there are times what Matt is speaking to is, it, you know, if, in my case, I was mentioned in the last episode about my brother, Richie, is he'd like to work outside if he could. Yeah. Now he happens to have a lot of leadership, but where he knows he can best lead is out in the field making a difference there. Yep. And Marty can really lead in the office. But Marty and Richie have to get on the same page as to, okay, we're taking on this next trade. Who do we need to bring in? Are we making an acquisition? What do we want? More trucks? What do we 
what's the financial budget look you follow what I'm saying? Absolutely. So there's gotta be that common app. And whether you do it with an outside thing or the rest of it, that's really good. But my feeling first and foremost is, and I did this with a company in New York, it's a family business, and they have multi-generations, we're not involved. And we went through leadership power together. And uh, we got through the exercises. And it's interesting because I, the, the person who's the general manager, so she's been anointed to drive the car. And, but she realized a lot of them got in the car because she said so not because they wanted to, and they weren't sure where they were going. This leadership power, getting on the same page and defining in clear, objective, written uh, goals with dates and deadlines and objective standards and mileposts along the way to go, yep, we reached that. What's the next one? Next, the next one. So breaking it down into little objective things that you can hit along the way to get to that big goal. So like, let's say uh, you're eight trucks now, you want 20 trucks. Each truck would be producing three hundred and fifty thousand dollars per year in revenue. Uh, if we have that, then we have classes set up and training. You can put more people on, and so now we, we've defined this goal in real clear, objective language. We could start putting in, uh, you know, what we believe that why we're able to do this, and then the action step. So leadership is really about this in this flowing fashion. So at the top is goal. And then underneath is the belief as to why you can make that goal come real. And the better the goal is defined in objective numbers, dates, calendars, whatever that is, not some, oh, we'll be the giant, we'll be a giant company. What the hell does that mean? Right. (laughs) You know, if you're one truck today, you're two trucks tomorrow. Oh, I doubled my size. That's not (laughs) what we're asking you. The, The goal is to make it a real goal, whatever that goal is, and make it real with numbers, dates, time. There is no goal police coming to your home and taking you away because you didn't reach a goal. It's not going to happen. So don't worry. But a lot of people are afraid to write their goals down. Mm. Whether you write them down, type, whatever you do. And they're certainly not making them real because they don't put them up on the wall. Matt, you know, is kind enough to share about it. He's very uh, digitally connected and this empowers him a lot. But he also finds by having up on a wall uh, you know these things so Matt share that about how that helped yeah so Al what about um let's talk a little bit I suppose about I know I know you want to talk about <clears throat> setting benchmarks and you know the whole the whole objective subjective sort of mythology there what's your what's your um what's your input on that yeah my, my feeling is so if you make the goal really objective about how many trucks by how much time whatever it is how many dollars it will be your belief in objective about how you can do it, then there's the action step. We need to set up so many training classes. We have to organize our replenishment. We have to get more guys trained. We have to do a better job of recruiting. All of that makes it happen. So that's objective versus subjective. It fits in just like the manuals where we had policies and procedures. So it's not unlike that. And so the better that we do that, the better that we're able to have these objective benchmarks like manuals and such, then family members coming on, we are clear about voting on that this is what we're doing. There's no mom and dad scenario that we talked about before. There's one goal coming out of ownership slash management, and that is the point of leadership. We are setting direction. We are setting course. We are setting a time frame. And then we go back and use our tools like the top five, the mass top 30, the master projects that we talked about way back in planning power. That allows the whole family to come together and be on board in that family car, not because they're a hostage, not because we said to, but they're excited about the drive we're going to take. Now, yep. there are some pitfalls that I want to talk about, Matt, before we, you know, before we get too far along here. So what, what is the, what I call the five Ds? The five Ds are the following. Death, divorce, disability, debt. And disaster. They will sabotage any business, but they are super important for family businesses. And here's what I mean by that. What happens, I'm the dad, Matt's the kid again, I pass away, my death or his death, that changes the whole succession scenario or whatever that is. So what's in place for that? Am I a key person? Is there insurance in place? Is there key man insurance? Is there a lot of different things? How much of what I know is translatable because we've documented it. So death, 
been planning for that. And then, you know, the last I checked that we all have expiration date. We just don't know when. <laughs> so death is very critical to family planning businesses. And there are ways to mitigate that and lessen that thing. Divorce is kind of a double-edged sword to hear in what I meant in two ways. Divorce is we're four family members. I'm in the middle of a heated divorce that has taking my attention away from the business and no longer filling the boxes I need to do. Plus, it's going to be money demand. I may actually have to be bought out of the business. Yeah. Or the three of us have worked together. We've tried our best. You know what, Matt? I hate your guts. I don't ever want to walk with you, work with you anymore. <laughs> Not, it's a lot like a partnership, right? There's got to, there, that is a reality. Sometimes yeah. we're, it's a better, a good divorce beats a bad marriage. And so that's what we're talking about. How do you do that in a clear, objective way? So the business has been valued. We know what the, if we don't want to be partners anymore, what does that mean? I'm going to buy you out over how much time and the business is not handicapped and you're not walking out with a, you know, a gold mine, uh, but you're also not walking out a cripple. So there's the D planning for the five D's, death, divorce. Are, are two of the first things that we need to do. You know what, Al? As you as you as you say, divorce within organisations. There, I immediately just sort of thought, well, you know, maybe even on a personal level, if you knew your organisational chart within your own relationship with your wife, <laughs> how powerful that might be. Hopefully, she, <laughs> hopefully she can't hear me saying this in the next room. But no, I mean, I imagine that if you do have a clear understanding of, you know, your roles and, you know, you're talking about how this might work in, a, in say, a partnership scenario within a business, how, you know, I hate your guts, you're not doing your job properly, this and that, I don't want to work with you anymore. It's probably largely due to the fact that you haven't set that structure in place initially and as a result, it's fallen apart. Yes, and your your tie back to the family is really good. We, we My wife and I didn't plan it. But fortunately, we took a long trip together early on in our relationship. And we had our first major fight. and We hadn't gotten out of the airport. <laughs> it was at the rental car, the <laughs> rental counter, and who had the credit card, who had the map, and, you know, all of this stuff was going on. And finally, we, we were 10 feet outside the airport and we go, okay, you do this, I'll do this, you do this, I'll do this, you do this. And so we informally came up with what we just described. And you know what? Life got better for both of us mm. right there in that moment. Wow. There you go. Yeah. Al Levy, marriage counseling. What do you reckon? Yeah. Well, family counseling is really what I do. I've, I've worked with a lot of families. Oh, okay. You know, sometimes it's it's out on the surface and I can see the tension. What's worse is it's hidden. Yeah. So I'm always, I don't want to ruffle his feathers. I don't want to make anything bad. So I'm never going to bring it up. Yeah. That is a mistake, my friend. Yeah. It's a big mistake. Now, there's a way to say it. There's a way to say it like we've talked about before about how to bring things up. Uh, you know, you were always a lousy big brother, and you're a really lousy big brother now, Matt. And I can't believe I'm here working <laughs> with you. I'm not exactly going to get me my desire. And says, so, you know, Matt, you and I have had our struggles together. And now that we're in the business together, let's see if we can figure out how to make this work for both of us. And yeah. if we can't, let's figure out an orderly way that, you know, to, you and I can split, and we'll both be friends. And when we meet up at the family party, we'll have a beer together, and we'll like each other's company. Yeah. So that's what I mean when I speak divorce mm-hmm. in the multiple ways that is so the other one is a disability um you know we're working together matt you're a key guy you're the financial guy in the family runs the financial things i you know I, i'm so happy that you're handling all that stuff and the budgeting and everything else that you know goes into it bills are paying on time and it's in the budget and we know where to run our company by real numbers uh but you get hurt or you get incapacitated um there's got to be a time that you can get well, but if not, I got to get somebody else into that box or everybody's going to be in trouble. So disability or disability insurance, and there's objective standards for how to do that. So God forbid one of us gets hurt or incapacitated and can't do our job or role. Um, just because you get hurt doesn't mean you get kicked to the side and there's no thing, but there's a legitimate way to set this up. There's a you know time frame series of doctors um, for objective testing, and there is insurance for this kind of scenario because that does happen, unfortunately, and especially in our trade. Yeah. You know, if I didn't wear glasses, there'd be so much metal shrapnel in my eyes. I couldn't go through a metal detector at an airport. Uh-huh. But, that you know, that's the nature of our business. Yeah. Uh, us as contractors, we get disabled, bad backs, bad knees, hips, 
you know, uh, it's just the nature of what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, and even, by the way, the fact that you sit in a desk, I'm not minimizing that. The disability is something that needs to be considered and what's an orderly and a smart way. So this is what we've been talking about for so long now, Matt, is either plan for it or expect to get run over by it. Yep. And so when I raise these issues, death, divorce, disability, the five Ds, I'm not an alarmist. I'm not, you know, like, oh, you know, trying to pull you off. I'm just trying to say, hey, buddy, I, I have seen this. Either it's happened to me or it happened ahead of my generation or I've seen it elsewhere. And the good news is I know a better way to handle this. And it's not. And if we do it proactively, I'll tell you a funny story. I mean, hopefully my wife won't ever hear this one. But she hated <laughs> the fact that my brothers and I all had wills at age 25. She said, you're 25 years old. Why are you making a will? And I said to her, honey, are you afraid because I make a will that I'm going to die as if I wrote it, made it happen? I said, because otherwise, here's what I think. I would rather determine what goes on in the business and for you and the family that we're going to build than having the court system figure it out or throwing the business in turmoil. And nobody wins at that. Mm. And so but now that we have wills and we have ways to fund the company and we have life insurance policies on each other. That is a good thing, not a bad thing. Yeah. So when I say this, I want to make sure that I'm trying to explain. I'm talking about what may be scary, maybe dark, but it's only scary and dark until you turn the light on. And I'm trying to shed light on it. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that was very well communicated. Good. Well, then the next D along the 5D strategy that I want to talk about it goes to leadership is debt. Matt talked about it. He referenced Ellen about, you know, Work do you work, but if it doesn't work, uh, we uh, we use this analogy: is uh, if you've ever been off the side of the road, you're stuck in mud or snow, and you're spinning, spinning the wheels. The first thing you got to do is take your foot off the accelerator, yeah, because uh, you're just digging it in the hole. And the same thing goes if your business year after year can't turn a profit, and you're not willing to do the things that it takes to run a successful business that creates wealth for you and others, and all you're creating is debt and in servitude for yourself and for anybody, family member coming in, uh, that we have to figure out a way to dissolve this because it's, it's, you know, I know sometimes people stick in the business for no other reason. They say it's got to work. And here's my answer. No, it doesn't. Mm. It doesn't have to work. It can work if you want to work it and you want to get smart. And it's a classic overuse of that expression, work smarter, not harder. But Ultimately, debt will sink your business. It will sink your family. Debt is a cruel, 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 cruel thing if yeah. you're not careful. Now, we have to take on debt. We have to take on debt to run our business. My dad pushed all his chips forward when he was young, and he decided that he was going to bet on only one thing in his life, and that is he would work his butt off to create a business, whatever that meant, and it was going to be successful, and he didn't care if he had to go door to door. But he was going to go into debt for this period of time to create the business that it was. And he was going to keep plowing money back into the business to make it work. But ultimately, if the business is not and we keep on creating debt, we have to figure out how to get out of that. We've got to return to a healthy financial state. And if not, this has also got to be addressed in about how do we split this up? Because all of us as family members going broke is not what we're after here. I suppose the other variable there as well is personal debt i mean that can also be crippling even within a business if you've got yes. you know a director or a family member or someone that's really struggling with debt i mean that's probably going to relay into their professional life eventually yes it does it it, it, it you won't sleep uh it's always draining you it can lead you into temptations where you can do even though you love me as a family member you can rip me off mm. uh, so that you have to be a, you know there's a lot of things that are brought up we, we, we just throw out the word debt but like Matt's talking about here, it's, it's very global. And it kind of what I was even talking about at divorce is, God forbid, Matt, you're my brother and you're in a divorce. That's going to take your time, energy, and money. Yeah. And your situation of where I'm going to say, oh, you know, we're making money in five years. Well, right now you're saying, well, that's okay, but I'm not going to make five years if I can't get this right. debt situa situation handled. I will say that all of, all of us are well served to learn what Ellen teaches, which is there's personal and uh, business budgeting and knowing some basic, basic, easy financial things that you should know when you're getting ready to get close to the cliff. Or if you're in that valley, there's a way out because you know what you need to know. 
sticking your head in the sand or not shedding light on it because you don't like what you're looking at is a really dangerous way to go. Yeah. And this again is the darkness is the darkness until you turn the light on. So that is one. So I want to, I want to kind of, cause I want to be conscious of the time here for you, but disaster is another one. And that's one that's typically outside of your control. So all of your trucks, your whole equipment, everything's housed in one main thing. God forbid there's a fire or there's a flood or your whole service area gets wiped out or there's urban renewal. There's all these, these are man-made and other type of social situations that can create a disaster. And so what is our planning for that? Uh, what have we put in, in place for that to handle that kind of disaster? Are you talking beyond insurance? Yeah, well, insurance is one of the key, key things because you're thinking what you just jumped to, Matt, because you're wiser than the average bear, is that you already thought about having insurance in place ahead of time and having duplicate systems and backup and not everybody in the same place. And, or, you know, what do you, have you recorded with the insurance company? What is and isn't covered? Do you have it documented? Did you ever do a video walkthrough? Um, what happens if the power goes down? Do you have backup power? You know, there's a lot of different things to disaster. But if the whole service area, you know, if out by where I am in Arizona, forest fires can take a whole city now. Yeah. And I don't care if you're the best plumbing, heating, cooling guy. If there's nobody living there anymore, it doesn't much matter. So disaster would be something that has to be addressed. Yeah. Now, that's a very big, strong thing. But here's what happened. Uh, I was out of the business, but in the New York area, the tri-state area, what they refer to, we had this monster storm not that long ago. And the hurricane, uh, Sandy, basically devastated three giant states. Uh, and anything along the coast, which was our business, my family lost 20 vehicles that went underwater. Whoa. Two zero. Two shops, two shops. I had plan for two different locations so if one shop goes down the other one could be our lifeboat neither one ever got a drop of water in the 20 plus years that we occupied the two buildings they both went underwater wow in that scenario we had backup generators and all of those failed i had created a phone net that if the thing goes down we could still answer our phone inside the net is where it fell down so my point is there are these scenarios. And the only thing that made a difference, speaking to leadership, I think it's a good way to drive it home. My brothers led the company and they had the culture of which that guys left their own home that needed work to come to work to serve customers. Are you getting that was the power of the leadership? And my brothers loved the people that worked for them. And they know that they're loved and they know that they're here to serve people. And that's a culture that cannot be beaten. And in the miserable, miserable conditions that they were dealing, I met my brother, Richie. (laughs) I finally came a month later and everything was black. I mean, when I came to home, so many people had no power and washed out. It really was devastating. And he said to me 30 days later, you don't believe how much better this is already, which is scary. So I meet him at eight o'clock in a parking lot. And I said, what are you doing now? He says, I'm going to put in my second heating system tonight. Wow. He didn't sit at home while his guys worked. Even at that state, he was out. Yeah. And they were always, so if you want to lead, lead from the front is my, my message here. Yeah. But everybody needs to know where is it we're going and why should I want to get in the car or on the train or any other analogy you want to do. And if it's an exciting game, if it's an exciting game, not just for you, and that brought up is the only game here is so that you can get a bigger boat. Yawn. I'm out of here. Uh, or is this really a game that involves, it's an exciting game we all want to play? Then I'm in. Yep. I'm in. And so leadership really is about planning. Now, do we have a moment to talk about how motivational mapping and profiling works with this matter? Or are we running out of time? Yeah, we're getting close. We can touch on it quickly. Okay. All right. So I, I work with, uh, even funny, in two different companies, two different things. There are four family members, which is very difficult and multi-generational too. <laughs> uh, what we do in leadership power is we did what we call motivational mapping and what uh, Matt refers to, I think he said personality uh, Profile. testing. And so it teaches members to understand in the family, why is this, what is it that you're comfortable in hearing? What do you hate? What do you like? What are you most attracted to? So this sharing of it 
I'll show you mine and you show me yours and we'll find a better way to work together. So like, I always wondered why, you know, I gave him that a test. He never seems to get it done, but he's got all the day, you know, all, if I ask him to go out and sell, he'll sell all day long. Uh, you know, why is Al like to work in accounting and do all this boring bookkeeping stuff? But if I ask him to get on the phone and be happy and polite, it's tough. Well, it's because we're wired that way. Now, it doesn't mean it can't be overcome. That's not what we're talking about here in leadership. So when we do the what I call motivational mapping, in this testing that we do is we learn about what words are important, what things are important. And if we learn to respect each other and what's important and how we're wired, magically, families can work better together. And every time we've done that exercise, Matt, always the great success. Yeah. Yeah, it's very powerful. Cool. Well, look, are you happy with wrapping that up now, Al? Or? I am. I am. Uh, what would you say is, uh, and I'm sorry for throwing it back over the thing here, but my take on leadership power, which is really from in the trenches, from getting control, from being the youngest in the family and being in the leadership role, and then helping others in family get through this leadership, what one or two things would you say, Matt, would be good takeaways for, the, for our listeners tonight? I like the don't tell me, show me mantra. So, you know, you know, you wouldn't don't get people to do something that you wouldn't do yourself. I think that's very powerful. And I think that on both a subconscious and a conscious level instills a lot of uh, faith and rapport within your your colleagues and organization. I also like it's not what you say, it's how you say it. I think that is very um, applicable in all areas of life, not just what we were talking about specifically in this episode. What about yourself? I think for me, I think those are really great takeaways, but I think when you've earned the way to do leadership power, it's about setting a common goal, making it really objective, and then getting the whole family to understand why we're doing it and the company, and again, setting direction. That's what you've earned yeah. by the time you reach leadership power. I think leading from the front as well is important, you know, making sure that, you know, you are the one driving the, driving the ship or somebody's driving the ship anyway. Yeah. I don't, do you read uh, Simon, if you're Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K, he did a great TED talk. No. Uh, most people know, have heard of him, but he, one of his great books, we started starting with why is leaders, uh, leaders eat last. Sorry for messing it up. Leaders eat last. And it talks about in the military and things that really well run organizations that leadership, really good leadership, in my opinion, um, is doing what we're talking about, is being out there, being accessible. Uh, it's, it's not one great leader and a thousand followers, which is what Jim Collins talks about. And good, great. Uh, if you're really a great leader, Matt, you are building other leadership power and skills in others. That's when it's really great. And since we're trying to back the family, if I'm your dad and you're my, you're my kid, not only am I making you a worker bee, but I am teaching you the skills of leadership and I am also demonstrating those skills. And I was blessed because my dad was that. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's 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 an awesome wrap up, I think, to this um episode. And it's an awesome wrap up to I guess this series, Al. Um that was man, I I can't believe how quickly we, that went through. But I mean, this has been amazing. We've done first episode was on planning power, how to build an organizational flat chart. And then we've talked about operating power and defining and writing what actually goes on within those, within those various stages of the organizational chart. And then that awesome um, episode, we just finished there on leadership and um, you know, leadership, I suppose within the family has, has certainly its own challenges. <laughs> oh, good group. But mate, I think you did a fantastic job of communicating that. I just want to say thank you very much. My pleasure. And, um, Listeners, our, uh, once again, Al has actually offered, first chapter of his book is going to be available through the site shed. So if you head across to the show notes, you'll be able to download the first chapter there. I thoroughly encourage you to do that. And then you'll also, of course, be able to get a copy of the 7 Power Contractor uh, through a link that Al's going to share with us. So um, look, with that in mind, I'd like to um, just say once again, thank you, Al. Thank you, listeners. And um, that is a wrap. <laughs> So if you haven't already, head across to the siteshed.com and register for our toolbox talks where you'll be regularly sent great episodes just like this straight to your inbox so you'll never miss one. 
Uh, if you want to join the community, you can head across to the siteshed.com forward slash members, where for a small monthly fee, you'll get access to regularly updated training material, as well as access to our forum where you can mingle and collaborate with trade-based business owners just like you from all over the world. If you're enjoying this podcast, please head across to iTunes and leave us a five-star review. We greatly appreciate it, and it helps us spread the word and reach the masses. Likewise, if you know anyone that might benefit from the content we create, then please go ahead and share this with them. You've been listening to Toolbox Talks by The Site Shed. For more great content just like this, head across to thesiteshed.com and join the amazing community of savvy trade-based business owners.